Ok, eh, buenos días, good morning. Uh, today we will have the conference of Dr. Herr Flick. He comes from the Department of Animal Physiology in the uh, University of Nymiga. Uh, um, his topic will be about the, his research uh, using the zebra fish, um, the welfare and the balancing welfare and production in fish aquaculture, but using the zebra fish like the model. Okay? I would like to thanks to her for this conference. Um, remember that when finish, we will have time just for uh, ask question to her and to speak about this topic. Her, thank you very much. Welcome again. <coughs> um, you know, this is yeah, your house. I know. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. Okay. Um, nice to be here, and uh, I will talk about uh, our recent research but also uh, somewhat earlier research on, on fish, where we have the intention to not only study fish as a, as a subject, but also look at fish for other fish. So that's what we mean with uh, translational studies. You can learn from some fish, like a zebra fish, far more, as I will show you, uh, because the genome is so well studied and annotated. And for many other fish, this is still a problem. I, I think the technology is rapidly uh, progressing and there will be times that, that this is old fashioned what I'm going to tell today, but uh, deep sequencing is still very costly and uh, the, uh, the logistics behind deep sequencing and analyzing the results from deep sequencing uh, uh, data is, is really a, a phenomenal task. So. Let's stick to what we have right now and see what we can do. So, uh, and the other question uh, that I was asked, and I, I talked a little bit about this uh, last year in the summer school here in Cadiz. Um, and uh, in effect, the lecture that I'm giving now is, has a frame that is similar to that lecture, but I have Im improved a lot of things in there. Um, we, uh, in, in our laboratory in Nijmegen, we study or are asked to study uh, aspects of welfare of fish because that is an increasing, uh, increasingly uh, uh, difficult topic whether you can play with fish like many people do or not uh, because there's many people who say fish are vertebrate animals like you are and you have to be careful with what you're doing to a fish and here is uh, of course a very uh, difficult discussion going on and I want to to give you an impression of how we think about fish and how we should deal with fish. Um, and I will introduce that in a more general setting and it is uh, because fish are one of the most if not the most important protein source in the world. Fish aquaculture and fisheries together bring uh, most of the protein that human beings need. And the problem uh, in, uh, in over time is if you look here um, over 10,000 years of growth of the human population, you see that until the Black Death in, in medi medieval times, uh, there, there was less than half a billion people on Earth. And right now in, in the last few decades, we've gone to 7 billion people and they all want to eat and they all want to eat fish protein. So there's a big problem. Uh, and the question therefore is, can we produce fish in a sustainable way? Uh, and, and the question is, of course, that, is that a challenge? Yes, you will. My answer is already clear, of course, that that is a phenomenal challenge to do that properly. Um, there's all kinds of instances like uh, steward, uh, uh, stewardships uh, councils that give labels for fish uh, that are caught. Um, but as I will explain to you, the content of what is behind the labels never takes care of the fish. It is about the ecosystem, blah, 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 but people never are concerned with the problems around the fish because they think fish are animals without feeling and without knowledge, etc., etc. So. Uh, I will show you that there is a big challenge there as well. 
if you look at what's going on, and this is last year's uh, overview, um, and th there's a few more things to say. Uh, undernourished people in the world, uh, and this was last year, and the, all these numbers are way up already. Uh, a phenomenal amount, a number of, of people are undernourished. At the same time, 1.6 billion people are overweight, so they eat too much. Um, people become obese and be become sick. They put an enormous uh, uh, burden on our societies. At the same time, you see that phenomenal numbers of people die because of hunger. They have no food. So things need to be distributed better. Uh, th this is just a few uh, insights in, in what's going on at the food uh, level. The water level, of course, is also a problem and also a concern when you talk about fish, because fish grow in water, and whether it's freshwater or seawater, you have to be aware that there is also limitations to water availability, in particular freshwater availability. And here are the prognosis for, uh, for, uh, from 1700 to 2050. Nine uh, billion people in 2048. I'm not too sure. I think if we are unlucky, there will be more than, uh, than uh, 9 billion. But there is an enormous uh, problem, of course, arising at the moment. And the problem is, is uh, uh, a stepwise process. We had a carrying capacity uh, for a long time, and then w which was sufficient for when the, the numbers of people were low, uh, relatively low. And then the Industrial Revolution, of course, made that, that more people uh, got work and, and uh, the population grew, technology improvements. Then the Green Revolution came. And the question right now is, are we reaching the carrying capacity of the world, of the Earth? And uh, there is hope in, in this uh, field. I'm optimistic uh, all the time. Uh, here you see the use of... Uh, well, human-controlled bi biological uh, production on, on land-based uh, economy before the agricultural revolution and what we do right now. You see there is still a lot of space and a lot of possibilities, but that can only be, uh, say, usefully uh, uh, taken if, if you share and if you distribute and if you do not make war, if you do not put your money in oil industry and in weaponry uh, industry, because that is the big economical thing, of course, on Earth. And uh, poverty and uh, hunger and uh, thirst, uh, for some uh, reason, seems less important. And that is really uh, worrisome, uh, at least that's the way I look at it as a biologist. If you look at the consequence of high, uh, high numbers of people on Earth, you look at the fishing yield in the, uh, in the seas and the oceans, then uh, you see everywhere the darker the color, the, the bigger the problem. And what people are doing, of course, clever as we are and all the technology we have, is that uh, we, we are going to fish deeper in the seas because it used to be superficial, of course, all the time. The nets that people use here in the Mediterranean or used in the Mediterranean maybe we're 10 or 50 or 100 meters deep. The sea is uh, kilometers uh, deep, so there's more space and more niches to be explored. And that's what we are doing right now. And the consequences is that 75% um, of the world population are maximally exploited, as we estimate at the moment. So there should be no more pressure on, the, on those uh, populations of fish. And the consequences are that people are going to fish for more species, Top predators disappear. The, you all know that uh, the big tuna, the bluefin tuna, is a worldwide uh, recognized problem. Uh, they disappear. Uh, catches of, uh, of tuna are getting smaller and smaller fish. And that is the reason that people think, for instance, that blue tuna, bluefin tuna is close to extinction at the moment. If you catch smaller individuals of a population, then you disturb the population buildup. So there's always two consequences of all this behavior. Um, 
The low stress levels are found at the moment in the Indian Ocean and Pacific. And uh, the, the next big problem to come in the world for, for you to know as a, as a biologist and a fish biologist is freshwater. Because freshwater is really limited uh, in, in its availability for us as drinking water, but also to culture fish uh, land-based. And that is a, a big thing, maybe not here in Spain, but in other parts of the world. Freshwater aquaculture is increasingly fast and, uh, and growing. Um, here you see an, an, uh, uh, an estimate from what is uh, caught and uh, aquaculture. And uh, the situation here is that uh, this is from 2005, so it's 10 years ago. And you, you see that uh, aquaculture is rapidly increasing. And at this moment, at this very moment, aquaculture is larger in its production than uh, the yields of fisheries. So the boats that go out on the oceans and the seas do not bring in as much food, protein, as aquaculture is doing. Uh, in, in another uh, comparison, uh, this is from an American uh, source uh, where you see that uh, the protein uh, coming from beef is already surpassed, in, uh, five years ago, was already surpassed by protein coming from fish. And you see the importance of fish and you also see uh, the importance of knowing what you are doing when you uh, want to produce fish. Another concern uh, which I always focus on is that uh, if, if the money is distributed unevenly and people like in, in America but in many civilized countries may have too much money, um, then you get the problems of overeating and uh, overweight. And here you see, for instance, a uh, survey of what happened in the, in the States between 1990 and 2010, so in 20 years' time, you see all the, all the states of the United States uh, became obese based on a BMI over uh, 25 or 35, I don't recall by heart. But in, in 20 years' time, the whole of the United States are becoming significantly more obese and, and, uh, and of course, also sick. Uh, this is what's going on. It's a normal picture. I must say, I, I've been... I'm growing myself as well, but uh, so I, I'm not complaining. But I do see here in Spain, uh, I, I visit Spain for 12, 15 years, and it, it is remarkable to see how many children on the beach are obese. And it is sort of a, a, a matter of status, like you see I can feed my children very well and it's not good. And it's junk food and there's all kinds of complicated things. The problem, of course, is it's not necessary. You should refrain from eating too much uh, because there is not enough food available at the moment. And how different was, was the situation in Minoan times? For instance, if you go back to uh, 3000 before Christ in Minoan times, you see an abundance of fish uh, caught by a few people, so there was no problem. And, and this kind of picture and, and awareness in, in population, in human populations, is very long-lasting, so like the, the Mediterranean is inexhaustible, which is not true, because wherever you go in, in the Mediterranean and you do a little bit of snorkeling or diving, there is very few fish, and it used to be really an abundant sea in the Mediterranean, it's not anymore. I want to say a few things about human culture, and uh, I take this picture first, this is from, uh, from the Knossos, uh, uh, palace in, uh, in Crete, where you see uh, the, uh, uh, what is called Tauro Catapsia, where men, human beings, were showing their power over an, in principle, invincible animal. The, these bulls are huge, and you know better than I uh, how strong they are. This was sort of this culture, you know, this is showing that you have the power and that you are stronger even than an invincible animal. Uh, Bull. Bullfighting, well, there are mishaps, of course. I want to talk about that. Bullfighting here in Spain is on the, de on the decrease, but uh, I've been traveling from here to here, and I saw in many places uh, bullfighting rings, so it's still there. 
um, here it's banned. Um, how long will that last? I'm, I'm not sure. What I want to say is this is deeply rooted in Spanish culture, for instance, the bullfighting. And I'm not going to discuss whether you should do bullfights or not. I know it's culture. It is showing your power. And this is a very important thing, of course. And I think the same holds for the Amaldraba, because in the Netherlands, I'm always asked to say something about tuna fishing, because this is such a huge problem, uh, some of the protectionists say, that we should fight it as much as possible. And then I always say, well, do you know about the culture? And have you been in Spain and have you seen what people are doing? And uh, I've been many times in Conil de la Frontera uh, on the Atlantic coast here, not far from here. Uh, and I know the Amaldrawe. In the Hotel Oasis where I stay, you take your binoculars and you see the nets in the sea and you see the ring where the fish are brought together and uh, taken out. I understand from uh, Juan Mi that nowadays in particular, the, the, the last part where the fish are put together, that the fish are shot by, by uh, a gun to decrease the stress level. Because, of course, the, the, the push, pushing the fish together is a phenomenally uh, stressful event for, for the animals. And it may even have, or I'm sure it has consequences for the quality of the fish if that lasts too long. And, of course, one of the big things in, in one of the items in, uh, in welfare, in fish welfare, is that if you want to eat fish and you can kill it appropriately, there should be not so much discussion around it. That's what we do with pigs and chicken and so on and cows. We give them an electrostun and then we kill the animal because it's unconscious and not too much harm to the animals. And this is forgotten by, uh, for fish, but uh, if I understand right from, from me, People are aware and they start now killing this big tuna by a gunshot, which is, in my opinion, one of the best ways to kill the fish because it's fast and rapid and uh, it's better for its welfare. Here's a picture from last week in Conil. There's a, a nice uh, agozelos, how do you call that? Tiles. Tiles on the wall in Conil de la Frontier where you see the, the, the virgin, of course, it's also a religious thing, so imagine the, the cultural roots of, of it all. You see here the fish that are... And, and this is like uh, Taurocatapsia. I mean, if you go into the water with all these big tuna, with uh, knives on the sides, you know, these fins are razor sharp. This is, this is bravery, what you see over here. And it's food, and it's religion, and it's culture. Here's uh, the lady from uh, La Fontanilla restaurant in <laughs> Conil. Uh, you see the fish here. What does that mean, uh, this frutalo? What does it mean? Enjoy. 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 Well, that's what we did, I'll show you. See? It's really <laughs> delicious. Top quality uh, tuna uh, from the Amaldrava. Uh, Amaldrava is not a problem. That's an ecologically friendly way of catching fish. Um, Sailing tuna factories like these big boats, that's the problem. Huge nets, kilometers, 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 uh, huge capacity. And the fish, well, used to go to uh, Tokyo for a major part. This is a picture I took myself, or maybe I took it from the internet, but I, I've been on this market a few times, six, five, five, six times. And there you see every day again, rows and rows and rows of huge tuna for the market. Right now, a single tuna this size will cost between 100,000 euro and some of the big ones, they are sold for 1 million euros at the moment. And it's all because of this, the, the toro sushi and the sashimi that they want to eat and they pay for it in Japan. But you see also that the decline is, is visible in uh, what is available still of, the, of this fish and that's why the price goes up, of course. And then my question, next question is, should we complain to these guys with the little boats here on the Cadiz Bay and tell them not to fish anymore because of the welfare of the fish? That is, of course, not the way to do it. We should make people aware of the consequences of what you are doing and be friendly to the ecosystem, including the fish, and then 
everything will be okay and there will be happy fish and happy people. But not those sailing factories that take uh, huge amounts of fish without any consideration except the money part, because it's economy of course. Some topics uh, with an eye for the fish, welfare topics with an eye for the fish. So how do I look at fish when you catch fish? Well, if you see this situation, it's immediately clear that there is something not good for the fish. The catching procedure, the fish here are pushed together and uh, they squeeze to death. The density that changes, of course, when you take the net and you collect the fish from the water. The duration of the catch, how long does it take before the fish dies? Air exposure is one of the worst uh, stress situations that we can offer to a fish. Uh, Roel Arendt did his first studies here with Juan Mee from Nijmegen and our collaborations where we showed what happens when you take a sea bream out of the water. They really don't like it. Damage to the body, of course, just uh, physical damage. Uh, slow death due to oxygen lack. This is air exposure, but still they cannot ventilate, of course, and uh, they get uh, a, a contradictory situation. They are in the air with a lot of oxygen, but they die because they cannot exchange. Uh, and they go alive or unstunned into the filleting machine quite often. There's many fish after such a catch that are still alive and they, they are cut open and the, their intestine is taken out and so on and so on. Unacceptable. And this question then next, is this aquaculture the solution or are we going to meet the same problems like you see in fisheries or the problems that we have seen in pig and, and uh, chicken and beef uh, industries where of course many problems uh, have been solved now but were huge problems. The problem is that people do not believe or still do not believe that, that fish is a vertebrate like you and me and that you have to be careful with that animal. So we get uh, all kinds of uh, labels, cage farmed, premium taste. So you see, you see how, how the industry is playing with the consumer. And uh, we get these, uh, these labels and when there's a label it's okay. And that's why I call it license to kill. No, it's not a license to kill because look at, the, at these things, whatever is there, it never talks about the experience of the fish. The fish is is, is in fact non-existent, it's just meat, that's it. But that's not the case, of course. Uh, again, license to kill, look at it. Uh, so, some uh, uh, fish are okay, according to all these labels. But once again, try to remember, there's no consideration on the fish itself. It's the ecosystem and so on and so on. You can see that. Uh, and then you have this, uh, the three Ps, Profit, planet, people, people, planet, profit, whatever it is. And this is then taken by the, the governments and by the, the big bodies in, in, uh, in, in Brussels, in the European uh, decision uh, makers. They talk only about PPP, society, economy, environment, but not about the fish itself. The fish is not an item. The fish is taken out of the ecosystem. And whether the fish is feeling pain or stress or things like that is not under consideration uh, under these uh, labels. So be careful with that. And there is, for you as students, there's a message for me that you should educate people in Spain and wherever you go that this is the case. Sustainability, setting the balance between profit, people and planet is difficult without knowledge of biology of, of fishes in general. And the biology of fishes is particularly difficult and poorly understood. And that's what the rest of my lecture is about. We need for, for a better fish welfare, not catching fish like this, we need a better understanding of fish biology. Do fish experience stress? Well, the answer is yes, you will see. I will show you sh shortly. Do they have pain? Yes, they have serious pain. And do they have consciousness? Is the fish aware of what's going on around it? Yes, it is. I will show you. And if you ask these questions, I'm sure if you go anywhere in Cadiz or in Spain or in the Netherlands or wherever you go, the layman, the, the general audience, the general public will answer no to these questions. Fish do not have pain. 
Fish do not have stress, ridiculous, come on. Fish have no consciousness. And that's where we have a task. So we have facilities to do all kinds of small scale uh, studies and we can go into the physiology of the fish. We look in the brain and so on and so on. This is a picture from one of the rooms in Nijmegen. Here are some, right now we have three zebra fish facilities and this is for tilapia or carp and we have three of these rooms. We have all kinds of facilities where we can do small scale physiology studies. Some questions uh, of general interest, how many fish species are on earth? Uh, 35,000. And if you look here at the division of vertebrates, so all animals with a vertebral column, 75% of vertebrate life is fish. So not unimportant, to say it mildly. When did fish come on earth? Uh, very short round uh, through time. The Earth originated almost 5 billion years ago. About, about 4 billion years ago, the origin of life is estimated to, to have taken place. And 550 million years ago, there, the first fish arose on Earth. Now, this is, if you look at, at this slide uh, later on, this will be put on the internet, I, I assume, uh, Fanny. Uh, you, you should have a look at, at these where, where human beings are, like we. 200,000 years since we, with our big brains, are here. Um, and you also see here when writing was first the case on Earth, and things like that. And then compare this to 500 million years of fish evolution. So there's a lot of possibilities in time, because for you and for all of us, it is very difficult to imagine what a million years is. And it's even way more difficult to understand what can happen in 500 million years. A lot, I can tell you. So that's the reason that we have so many fish, because fish, uh, you find them in any niche. They, they have had 500 million years of time to adapt to all kinds of niches. Streams, rivers, lakes, seas, oceans, tidal pools. Um, you can, f you can define any type of niche, any type of water, and you will find fish in there. And that is uh, interesting, of course, and amazing. And the reason for that all is in all likelihood that in the ancestor that we share with fish, so we have a common ancestor, uh, whole genome duplications occurred. You see WGDs. And that some happened somewhere here in, a, in an ancestor that we share with fish and all the other vertebrates. Uh, and what does it mean, a whole genome duplication? So that, that is a, uh, I will show you in a minute, a phenomenon that is very common in DNA carrying organisms. Uh, here, for instance, for plants, if you think that whole genome duplication is something special for vertebrates, no, it's a very common thing and it has to do with the biochemistry of DNA and nothing else. Here you see many, many times tetraploidy, hexaploidy, polyploidy, and this is just in plants, and it, it happens every now and then, but also in, in uh, fish. And what, what does it mean? More DNA, more functionalities. You get, as, a, as an organism with more DNA, you have more genes to read, and more genes that you can functionalize, so genes that have a special function. If you have a function for eating uh, strawberries and a gene for eating, uh, and two genes and one for strawberries and one for cherries, you are more, more powerful. Yeah? So more, uh, more library, more power, more functionalities is the message. At the same time, you have to, to keep in mind that this, this complex DNA biochemistry um, has uh, has many more aspects, and you see some of that over here, titopluralization, uh, again, titopluralization, and then also in some fish like the fuhu, the, the, the titrodontids, uh, uh, the puffer fish, you can get a contraction of uh, genome, so you get rid of the intron information, you get very compact axon-rich uh, DNA. Uh, these things are continuously going on, and in fish, you will find the most extreme examples of those phenomena. 
Another thing which is very interesting for you to remember from this slide is that two fish that are really in the center of interest right now are the zebra fish and the medaka. And people tend to put them together as the two genome, well-known genome and uh, blah, blah, blah. It's fish, but they are almost uh, 100 million years separate uh, from one another in evolution, which means that the Medaka uh, arose later on Earth and has not as many adaptations as you may find in a zebrafish or different adaptations. So be careful comparing a zebrafish and a Medaka, even though people are focusing on that very much. Plasticity is another thing that, uh, that we should uh, realize is, is an important thing in, in, in uh, biology. Here, again, I, I'd like to play a little bit to, just to stimulate you in thinking. This is uh, a well-known flower in, in the Netherlands. Uh, I don't know, you can eat it also. But you see three species, uh, three, the same species, three different niches, completely different plants. And uh, that is what we also see in fish. And that is important to know, to understand. The, uh, I'm talking about the biology of fish. We, we need a better understanding to appreciate welfare. We need a better understanding of the biology of fish. And in that biology is also plasticity. Plasticity of phenotypes. How do fish look? Are they the same? Is it the same gene package that makes these phenotypes? Is the plasticity in brains? Because we want to say something about consciousness, about learning and, and so on, stress. And maybe it's a seasonal plasticity. If you study a fish in spring, it may be different in summer or in winter, but it's really important that you realize that these things are occurring. And I will give you an example. Cichlids from Africa, the most, the best studied uh, species of fish with a phenomenal adaptive radiation. So there's an ancestor and in a matter of 20, 20 to a million years, but even very short terms, uh, in, in, in a short uh, period of time, you can get adaptive radiation because a niche will become available and the fish will take it and the, the genome is so well equipped that you can get uh, this, uh, this adaptive, adaptive radiation from a single s uh, species to start with. And they don't look similar anymore, but they are very closely related. The Darwin finches you have in the Galapagos Islands is a similar example of adaptive radiation. Plasticity in brains. Mm -hmm. This is what you see when I say brain. This is the picture that you recall from your memory, somewhere from in here. Um, that's a human brain and there's many more brains. Do we have the biggest brain? Many people, if you ask, yeah, oh yeah, we have the biggest brain. No way, an elephant has much larger brains than whales as well. It is the, met the, the importance in brains, just a small side step, is the connectivity. It's not some, and it's the number of neurons that is important, and the connectivity of the neurons, not the volume, because, um, for instance, dolphins and whales, they have a huge brain because there's lots of glia, so supporting tissue, when they dive and to protect from uh, cooling, things like that. Uh, so there is a huge variety in vertebrate brains, but there is a shared what we call bauplan. So there is a, a basic anatomy which is similar for all vertebrates. Whether, whether you have this as an end product in a shark or an amphibian or a reptile or a bird or a mammal, the bauplan, the, the original star, the neural tube, is the same in all, all these animals. And uh, just as one example, here you have a fish brain. This is an electric fish brain. And what you see here in blue is the cerebellum, the small brain of this fish. And relatively spoken, this is the biggest small brain that we know in vertebrates. And if you look at the connectivity, I'm not going to show maybe this afternoon in another series of lectures. If you look at the connectivity of the neurons in the, in the small brain of the electric fish, that is way bigger, the connectivity um, more dense than in our brain. So it's just where you need it for. Uh, electric fish need that to make maps of the environment and read electrical fields that they produce themselves. 
Another thing for you to remember, if you don't know, is uh, that telencephalic development in vertebrates differs in one particular sense, and that is that the front part of the brain in fish develops differently from all other vertebrates. And that's what we call uh, evagination and uh, eversion. You see here the neural tube, and you uh, look at the numbers where they start and where they end up, and you will see that in a vertebrate uh, like we, in a mammal for instance, uh, number five, it is five, and so in the middle of the brain, inside the brain, and in fish on the outside. And this phenomenon, this eversion uh, process, um, is, uh, if you want to uh, know more about it, it's a wonderful uh, uh, journal issue on this topic. Um, but that is one of the reasons that people for a long time were looking uh, at the wrong spots for functionalities in the brain. Because they thought, well, amygdala should be on the outside, amygdala fear, learning hippocampus on the inside, and the fish is just the other way around. Uh, also, uh, phenomena in fish that you should keep in mind is that fish continue to grow, most of the fish, including their brains. And that means that, the, the, like in our situation, the brain at one point after... Uh, Say in, and after puberty and early uh, adulthood, our brain is fixed. There are things going on, of course, but it doesn't grow larger. In fish, it can grow throughout its life. Not, not, not as big as the fish itself, but the brain is continuously growing. So there is continuous changes in the brains of fish. And another thing in fish, which is unique to the lower vertebrates, is regeneration. Stem cells and regeneration. If you look here, this is for, uh, uh, what is it? Well, it's a, a mouth, I think, and a bird and a, and a fish. You see the regions in the brain that can regenerate. If you make a lesion, then it will grow back. There's stem cells everywhere in those brains that makes fish very different. And this, this difference in uh, regenerative uh, capacity also relates to temperature control. Fish are ectotherms. The environmental conditions determine the temperature of the fish, of most fish. Uh, the other uh, uh, mammals and, and birds are endotherms, and that has consequences for how they can play with uh, cell regeneration and, and, uh, and so on. Um, enormous differences in uh, brain morphologies, and still networks for social behavior are indicated here in yellow, and reward, one of the things that we all want to be together, applause and, uh, and, a sh uh, and how do you say? When I do like this, well done, you know, <laughs> that's a reward. Uh, and their connections, they are everywhere in all vertebrates and, and it's everywhere present. Plasticity in hierarchy, here you see a dominant fish and a subordinate fish, the same fish differences in colors and so on and so on. Differences in uh, the males, both male testis size is different. But also look at the GnRH R1, the, so the receptor for uh, the releasing hormone from, uh, from the brain in the pituitary, huge differences. The same fish, they're very, very different when you look at this level to the, to the fish. Seasonal plasticity, as I uh, announced, is enormous. Uh, enormously important in fish. Uh, this is, this is a, a goby type of fish which is completely different in summer and in spring and in winter. So be aware of that when, whenever you do endocrinology or behavioral studies. Uh, the, the, the genome may be functioning differently in spring than in, in winter or, the other way or summer. Uh, another example, uh, this is from a colleague uh, of us in uh, Norway, Lars Eberson, son of a famous neuroanatomist. A smultification in salmon, you know that fish go from part to smolt, and if you look in, in the brain, the, those are two completely different fish, but it's the same species, of course. So be careful. And uh, the last message in this series, the phylogeny of fish, so if we look at all the fish that we know on Earth, more or less, uh, my message is, and I, I try to make a little joke such that you remember it better, 
what we call a fish maybe as different as a mouse or a moose. Moose is the big, uh, the big uh, deer, you know, is from Canada. It's only one letter difference, but huge difference. But the same holds for, for all these fish. Medaka, I told you already, and zebra fish, huge distance, evolutionary distance, and the consequences of that evolutionary distance for adaptations in the fish. Is there pain in fish? It's the next question. I can, 10 minutes, then we shift. Uh, we break for a little and then after the break we go on. Is the pain in fish? Well, functional anatomy. Uh, our pain system is uh, composed of at least two important uh, components. A delta fibers for rapid pain. If I give you a kick, you feel a rapid pain. If I kick you really hard, the pain may still be there tomorrow. The second, the lasting pain is transmitted by C fibers. And uh, you can do experiments where you cut the A delta or the C fibers and you take away the, the, the parts of the pain perception that you see. And the, the, these fibers, A delta and C fibers as they are called, have their peculiar properties. So uh, you can look at them and, and see if you can find them in fish. Because if people say fish have no pain, I can say, well, I think fish do have pain. And I will show you because they have the fibers to transmit noxious stimuli. And this was already uh, done. Uh, uh, she, she deserves uh, the credits for that by Lynn Snedden, uh, a famous uh, paper on uh, trout head where here you see the receptors that can transmit uh, thermal or pressure or uh, chemical noxious stimuli. And you see that all these uh, potential pain receptors are located and situated in the head. Uh, they're, they're also over the body or everywhere. I will show you in a minute. Um, but in particular here in the head, there's these receptors that can take pain uh, signals. If you inject uh, venom or acetic acid near those receptors, you get uh, significant changes in behavior. This is uh, mean time to resume feeding, which means it takes longer for the fish if you give this painful uh, stimulus before it will start eating again. And that's really one of the parameters that you normally use to, to say that the fish is more or less uh, comfortable. And the other thing is opercular beat rate. If the fish get aroused, gets aroused by, by a painful stimulus, then uh, you will see more ventilation uh, frequency. And that's what you see here, so the venom and the acid uh, do provoke uh, these changes and they last for a long time. It's not just the injection which is, which is evoking this response, but it's the injection uh, with the uh, noxious stimuli that makes uh, this behavioral difference. So we asked ourselves if we clip, because in uh, zebrafish and, and uh, all uh, say studies where you use the genome of the fish, you do genotyping and you cut a piece of, uh, of fin from the fish uh, to, uh, to determine the genetic makeup. And we know that fins regenerate, so no problem, because they regenerate. But the question, of course, from a biological point of view, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, a, not a softy saying that you could, should not do that, but my question is more, is this a potential painful stimulus that you give when you clip the fin? And what we are after are these neurites, what we so-called call, so -called, uh, free-ending sensors, which are present in your skin. If you press your skin, what you feel then is, is uh, transmitted by these fibers. That's the only part of the epithelium, uh, which is uh, coming from the, uh, the sub-epithelial layers. There's no blood vessels in your epithelium, but there is these neurites that penetrate in between the cells of your skin. And the question is, do fish have them as well? So we clipped the fin and we did uh, some histology. And we find uh, neural tissue everywhere, between the bones and in between the bones, so between the fin rays and so on. And with electron microscopy, if we take the clip into fix fixative for electron microscopy, we do indeed find these uh, C fibers and a delta fibers, and this is a Schwann cell that makes these myelin sheets. And the, these fibers obey exactly the morphometry 
of the fibers as you have them in, in your body. Uh, the distribution of A delta and C fibers is different in fish. So the abundance is, is different than in mammals, but both types of fibers are there. And here you see a PGP 9.5 neurite staining, so that is a protein that occurs only in uh, neural cells, in neurons. You see in, in green here, this is the bone again of the, the fin ray. You see the tissue here, you see here all kinds of, all kinds of staining. And here you see these fibers that reach almost close to the water. So the situation is exactly the same as in your uh, skin, where it comes to free ending sensors for, for pain. Now, is it pain? I mean, this is, we talk about nociception right now, but is it pain? Is, is it doing something with, in higher centers of the brain? Uh, we know that pain is a, a very powerful tool to affect uh, behavior. If, I, if you are in pain, you cannot study as well, you, you will not play, blah, blah, blah. You can think of it yourself. Uh, and again, uh, we should be aware as biologists of the variation in individuals uh, the pain comes in varieties, uh, how uh, is an individual perceiving the pain and so on, Th those are considerations that you have to take. Maybe that is also valid for fish, later on you will see. So, is the pain perception, that means that if you cut yourself with razor blade or you hook the fish, the signal, this, this pathway has been shown. In humans we know of course that there is connections to higher brain centers, the question is, is this also true in fish? Now, if we can show that a complex behavior is altered by a painful stimulus, a fin clip, for instance, then you have an indication that a behavior that depends on higher centers in your brain, not just on the reflex from pain, from pain to your back and back, uh, but also to the brain, then uh, then you have a good reason to believe that fish is doing something with the noxious stimulus. And that we can show, uh, this is the first experiment that we did, was, is difficult behavioral studies. This is cototaxis. The fish will, go, will have a preference for a white or a dark, a light or a dark environment. And uh, with uh, tilapia you can, uh, by fin clipping, and not by the handling stress that is involved in the whole procedure, by fin clipping, you can change that behavior for some time, uh, one to six hours. You see this effect and then it's over. Um, another thing, and then uh, we stop uh, for, for the first round, is the gill, gill mucus cells uh, before and after fin clipping. So this is the same experiment, but we looked at the gills of the fish and, and the mucus cells in there. And maybe if you look at it here, you can see lots of mucus cells and uh, that's uh, the control, and then here is the one hour, you see almost no mucus cells, and then after six hours, they're all back again. And we, of course, control this experiment, because you have to catch the fish, and you have to hold the fish. Um, but you see that there is a short, uh, of short duration response, which is specific for the clipping. And I w I've always been wondering, how, how can it be? Apparently something is going on when you clip the fish that is different from handling and all the procedures which the fish also doesn't like. The fish, the fish do not like a net, do not like to be taken by hand out of the water for a clip. And apparently something uh, peculiar is going on because the fin clip is specifically inducing this huge uh, release of, uh, of mucus. And I think it's best explained by this because the mucus cells, and this is for the human situation in the lung, but the situation in fish is, is uh, similar. There is a sensory nerve system and there's cholinergic and adrenergic uh, nerve system and there is the adrenal. So there's four, uh, four situations, four pathways that are uh, controlling mucus release and I think when you cut nerves, as, as you've seen because you saw the nerves on the, on the slide, so you cut the nerves, I think you're doing something really bad and you get this peculiar pain-related mucus release which is stronger than in the control situations. Uh, there's good reasons from all kinds of old literature that uh, there are projections up 
and interpretation in the telencephalon. This is electrical stimuli in, in a catfish, mechanical stimuli, acoustic stimuli, fish have ears like we have inside at least. And they have some pathway to the telencephalon, which you see here. And the, those are called the pallial areas of the telencephalon. And those are, let's say, similar structures as what we call in our brains amygdala, hippocampus, and so on. And uh, final slide before coffee, zebrafish. Here you see uh, neurons that are uh, uh, in, in transgenic fish that are manipulated to express uh, proteins that are related to signaling pain stimuli. You see here the yolk sac and the eye, and here is the telencephalon. And you see that the systems that are taking the messages from the tail region to the front of the fish, they are also projecting towards the, the telencephalon. So there's good reason and, and, and good uh, evidence now that fish have the systems to perceive painful stimuli and also that uh, the information is carried to the frontal parts of the brain, the telencephalon. That's over there. Is this, uh, so let's have a short break and then we go on. Okay. Uh, say in 10 minutes. Time for coffee. For a coffee and then 10 minutes. 10 minutes we go on. Yeah. Okay. Right. Suspense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go on. Stress in fish. All right. I'll, I'll be short on stress in fish because if you want to learn more about stress in fish, I think I'm going to talk this afternoon and tomorrow afternoon. Just a few things. Um, what we need, uh, and, and the, the most recent views on stress uh, are these that stress is not a phenomenon that is regulated in a homeostatic way but in an allostatic way, which means that there is on an individual basis and on a species level basis uh, mechanisms that, that may give different answers for the responses that you see. And allostasis means constancy through change. So it means that an adaptive mechanism uh, can adjust the stress response. Uh, the stress response at a low temperature may be different than at a high temperature. In a low density, it may be different than in a high density, and so on and so on. And you need to adjust the output of your stress axis, which is adrenaline and cortisol. And there is another important thing. I think uh, that the real stress hormone is adrenaline. That is the first minute, seconds to minute signal uh, telling the body something wrong and I need sugar. That is what adrenaline is doing, releasing sugar to make fight or flight possible. And then uh, the second hormone that comes into play is cortisol. And in general people say cortisol is the stress hormone in any vertebrate. I, I, I want to challenge you to think about it carefully because I think Cortisol is more important for restoration. Yes, it is important also to deliver sugar, uh, gluconeogenesis, release from, uh, from uh, glycogen and so on and so on. Um, what cortisol is doing is redistributing energy flows in the body of the fish to cope, to learn and, and to allow to cope with new situations. That is what cortisol is doing. But the first, the real stress hormone is adrenaline and cortisol is a stress-related hormone, which is more important in the adaptation process that comes after the original search of adrenaline. Uh, this is an, uh, a welfare allostasis uh, relationship where you, and this is what we generally uh, uh, use in our description of, of stress. And there are two situations 
that we call distress, that is where welfare is poor and uh, where the challenges to the fish are either too low, no, no challenge or almost no challenge, or too high, too much challenge to the fish. If you never are exposed to challenges, you don't know how to handle a challenge when, when there is a challenge to come. And that, that is the distress at this situation where the fish will overreact or the fish doesn't know what to do with the challenge it gets because it, it never had the opportunity to learn. If there's too much stress, then there's too much uh, hormones that interfere with all kinds of processes also and uh, any challenge here may be just too much. And that's the two situations of distress. But there's a whole area of eustress where stimuli are taken uh, by, the, by the individual, by the fish in this case, and the fish learns from the, the challenges it gets. And the challenges are, and this is important for you to remember, intensity uh, are a product of intensity, duration, predictability and controllability. And you can put in any value, say one for intensity, and then duration two or three, and so on. And you can play with these, with these uh, parts of the challenge. But those are the four things that are relevant to determine stress. The challenge that you give to the fish is determined by this. Also, you see here the homeostasis concept, which dictates that uh, with increasing challenge, the welfare will go down. Now, this is not true. We know that fish do need certain challenges to, to show eustress responses. So this is old-fashioned, forget about it, or at least put it in, in the concept of allostasis, where you see that there is a, a whole area in welfare uh, settings where the fish can give a good response and survive. Yeah? Also, you perform better under some stress. If there's no stress whatsoever, if you go to the beach and, well, exam tomorrow, failure. But if you are a little bit pressed, then you will perform better. For acute stress regulation, we have all the ingredients in fish that you also find in, uh, in mammals or in human beings. Uh, CRH, but a lot more. You see here, CRH and CRF is the same, by the way. Your tensins, TRH, AFG, everything here in the hypothalamus, which is an old part of the brain and a very important part of the brain, everything in the hypothalamus in fish is the same as in any other vertebrate. And this is convergence in evolution because if you look at the origins of the cells, where they come from and where they eventually end up in the brain, that may be different. But every stress system that I know in any vertebrate has these components. Uh, stimulatory, inhibitory, dopamine and uh, melanophore concentrating hormone and then the pituitary gland which is uh, differently organized in a fish from other vertebrates because the cells are more topologically distributed. You can find the rostral parasitalis with the ACTH cells and the prolactin cells and the parasitamide with the MSH cells and the uh, somatolactin cells and then the whole bunch in between, the, the TSH and the gonadotropins and so on, the growth hormone in the middle. But everything is there, and th this is typically an example of convergence and evolution. All ingredients are there, arranged in a different way, but the eventual functionality is the same. You have, of course, the receptors for these hormones, and cortisol is the uh, interrenal output, uh, which we study a lot. So. I never talk about adrenaline because it's really, really difficult to study adrenaline in fish because you have to catch them and then the, the response may be over already. But we do know a lot about cortisol and the consequences of cortisol surges, what happens if you get cortisol uh, elevation. And we do know about the, the receptor mechanisms that you find in all vertebrates, including fish. Here you see, by the way, uh, the CRH in blue and the ACTH in brown, so it's a double stain in the pituitary. That's another thing that is, for instance, different in fish. The CRH cells from the hypothalamus project directly on the ACTH cells in the pituitary gland. There's not an, an, uh, a portal system like in our uh, pituitary system. 
Um, stress is there. Uh, so acute stress responses, acute cortisol responses. But we also know that under chronic stress, uh, fish uh, show elevated levels of cortisol. And that is not related to ACGH and CRF because that needs to be a pulse, a surge. Otherwise, the signal function is gone. But if you need a chronic elevation, you, the fish do that by activating TRH mainly and playing with CRF binding protein, so taking away the CRF signal and uh, putting a pronounced position for TRH as a corticotrope. And TRH then will activate MSH in the, in the pus intermedia of the pituitary gland. And MSH has mild corticotropic effects. So we have a different system for acute and for chronic stress elevation of cortisol. This is uh, yeah, a long time ago that we published all these things. Um, remember that cortisol levels vary in an individual, but also among individuals and among species, etc. I will show you a few examples. First, an, an example of what you can do with the zebrafish, a very simple experiment but with great consequences. What we do here, we keep uh, the zebrafish in a beaker glass and here is a stereo bar and the machine and the, the Vortex machine is connected to uh, a clock, simple clock from uh, Gamma, it's called in the Netherlands, I don't know how it's called here. Uh, you can put the pins in a regular uh, uh, modus or you can put the pins in an irregular mode and the stereo bar will go on and off. And of course you can also put the speed to your wish. And what we do here is, here you see the relation between the cortisol content in the fish after exposure to two, three, four hundred RPMs of spinning. So the fish is forced to swim, which they normally do not. The zebra fish are s s uh, schooling fish that swim around very slowly, but they, they can swim. And but you can also see, this is air exposure, it's the worst thing you can do to the fish. But you can see that we can manipulate uh, stress level in the fish just by putting up the machine. So that is a powerful tool because dosing stress is very difficult in any animal, but here it's possible. And we have a, a setup like that. And we can, of course, play with the intensity. We can play with the predictability by setting the the moments when the, when the, the stereo bar is going on. And uh, also that will allow for, the, if the fish knows after a while, well, every hour there will be a steering, then it can control its response to that. So that's the way we play with that in Nijmegen. Here you see uh, cortisol content controls stagnant water, so st still water, predictable stress and unpredictable stress. And you see that the degree of stress is determined for an important part by whether stress events are predictable or controllable. And uh, in relation to individual uh, differences, so within the same species, zebrafish or tilapia or carp, whatever, we recognize um, shy bolt, hawk, dove, proactive, reactive fish. These phenomena, these terms are really under discussion nowadays, but still in biology it is handy to know what we mean with that because it reflects the, the extremes of what you find in behaviors in a population. And if you want to know more about it, you should uh, activate this uh, website. Here I give you an example from, from tilapia and, and I'll explain you why this is so important. Here is a male tilapia which is dominant and you can see on the outside that this is the dominant fish. Here is the sub subordinate or the, the not dominant uh, males, which we call then reactive and these we call pro proactive. Now imagine you have a fish like an eel, where you cannot see on the outside what type it is, whether it's proactive or reactive. And you're going to analyze the fish, you take blood samples, and you will, give an average, you will get an average value with a huge standard deviation as a result of mixing proactive and reactive uh, samples. So you see the power of, of, of this model. And you also see that a proactive fish is more an adrenaline fish 
then a cortisol fish and a reactive fish is more a cortisol fish than an uh, adrenaline fish. So they are endocrinologically completely different fishes, the same species. It's just a matter of social cues, whether you are dominant or, or subdominant. But if you mix the samples, you won't get any answer. And that's the beauty of this fish. Um, there's many uh, other things that are different between the extremes of coping styles, as it's called. So you have fish that are proactive and reactive. The proactive have all these qualities, and the reactive fish have these qualities. Avoiding risk, seeking risk. Aggressive, heartbeat is much higher, cortisol responses here, higher adrenaline the other way around. Typical for the extremes. Now, you should, you should keep in mind, if you do stress research, can I tell whether a fish is proactive or reactive? If not, you may end up in a big problem, and you may never find anything. Uh, effects of cortisol, well, uh, you need a readout for, for cortisol, and this is one thing we can do. This is an antibody to uh, sodium potassium HPase in the chloride cells in the gills, and then uh, the antibody uh, that sticks to the sodium potassium HPase that antibody is uh, probed with a gold-labeled uh, uh, antibody. So you can count the number of gold uh, particles uh, on, the, uh, on the volume of tubular system in the chloride cells. And that is influenced by cortisol. Here we have uh, disturbed the fish with a net or we have put cortisol on the food so that the cortisol levels go up in the fish. You see the consequence uh, at the cell target in the gills. Uh, and here you see also distribution of chloride cells, uh, controls, and you see that the cells start to move, become larger, and so on and so on. So typical effects of, of cortisol, a effect of cortisol. Another uh, uh, thing that, that is linked to social status and the stress response is what you see here, dominant fish exposed to a fight uh, uh, event. The dominant fish, they restore their cortisol uh, levels very quickly, but the subordinate or the submissive, the reactive fish, they are scared like hell and they cannot restore their cortisol levels quickly. And if this happens too often, it will result in patho uh, pathologies, so the fish becomes sick. You see the same species, the same same genome, more or less, but the phenotype of the two fishes is completely different and it's reflected in the response to a fight uh, uh, exposure. I, I want to show you uh, a few more things that we do regularly in Nijmegen and it is very important that you, th th there's a surprise in this set of data. This is on catfish, which is a popular fish in uh, the Netherlands for aquaculture. I don't know why, because it is distasteful, <laughs> horrible fish to eat, but we export it to Germany. <laughs> but it is, a, it is a phenomenal fish, I can tell you. And one of the problems, the fish is popular because it can take dirty water, uh, you can keep it in high densities, and so on and so on. Here you see an experiment where the, the tanks are blackened. Uh, because we don't want to disturb them uh, too much. And then there's infusions of ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate, the natural uh, nitrogenous waste products in the, in the water. And I'll just give you a, a short view of the gills. This is control with the, the dark spots are the chloride cells. And here, controller is Dutch for control. Uh, so we increase the total ammonium uh, content of the water, uh, controlled. You see already what's happening here, 30, 90, 270. The gills fuse more or less, it gets one solid block of tissue. Now if you do this to a sea bream or a salmon or a carp, it will be dead. This fish is perfectly happy. And why is that? Because these fish, they have an a, a, a sort of a tree-like structure at the, at the two final sets of, uh, of gills where they can breathe air. So they, can, they are not dependent on the gills for gas exchange. And uh, you see here the, the catfish, it's called the walking catfish. They can do outside the water very, very well. And uh, 
my message is, well, this is the kind of studies that we do for telling the industry what they should do and what they should not do because these fish at those high loads of ammonium do become more sensitive to subsequent stresses. But first of all, know your fish. Why are these fish so popular? Well, because they're extremely strong, which doesn't mean that they are not vulnerable because the industry, when, when we did these studies, the farmers said, nothing wrong with our fish, nothing wrong. And then we asked, well, if nothing's wrong, can we come in and have a look at the fish? No. Uh, no, you cannot enter. We know that uh, these fish, <laughs> because they can breathe air, they tend to jump out. The biggest mistake that people make they take the fish that is jumped, has jumped out of the tank, they throw it back in the tank, and then it's war. Because their skin is loaded with pheromone-producing cells, alarm pheromones. And if you throw a fish back into a tank, they will start fighting, and they, they are cannibalistic. They will kill one another. Disaster. No problem. There's never any problem in, <laughs> in catfish aquaculture. It is, it is one of the most difficult fishes to keep in a proper way. And m many uh, farmers go broke overnight because they have an accident like such a kill and then the, the margins of what they, what they get, m money they get for the fish is really low, so if they have a disaster then uh, they're gone. Well, uh, we've been talking already about the brain and the, the tail encephalon and uh, the, the different areas in that uh, brain. And I want to show you a few results uh, of the involvement of those brain, that, that brain part in, in learning and fear avoidance in fish. Um, first of all, here is a comparison of the brain of a cyprinid, so carp or a zebrafish, and the brain of rodents. This is a, a mouse or a rat. And uh, with modern techniques and gene expression studies, we can show that essentially every bit that you find in a rat or a mouse you will also find in a fish, but at a different spot. The tail encephalon develops in a different way in fish. This is the fish, this is the rat. But you can see in blue and in red and in green, in different uh, uh, distribution and different topologies, but everything is there in fish and in, uh, and in uh, other higher vertebrates, say. This is really, uh, I don't know how, this is, uh, the PDF that you will get uh, is, uh, is better. I apologize, I don't know why this is so light, but this is just to show you a, a comparison between ascending auditory pathways in rodents, so the brain is here, and here for a, a cypnid, for a zebrafish, and the interesting thing is that in this case ascending auditory, so sound information, is going to amygdala in, in a rat, and uh, there's all kinds of connections. The connections are very different in a fish, but also in fish, sound information is going to the amygdala. Amygdala are the parts involved in fear. If you are afraid of something, those parts are involved in handling fear. And sound is something fish do not like. The vibration in the water fish do not like that. And you see here that there are connections for the auditory pathway. Visual pathway, similar story. Very different uh, routes for, uh, for connections, but eventually you will see that signals, visual signals, will go to areas involved in, in fear and pain, and uh, pallial areas in the fish brain, and hippocampal parts. Parts that are sim similar or functionally similar to what we call a hippocampus, and yes, our hippocampus has a complex cortex structure with pyramidal cells and uh, granular cells and so on and so on. That is not present in fish, but the neurons that take the information are certainly there in fish, similar to what we have in our hippocampus, so big integrating cells. The structure around it is different, and yes, the functionality in fish is not as complex as it is in higher vertebrates, but it's there. And here, this is an experiment from Broglio et al., Italian guys. Uh, here you can see where it's published. To make, think, make a long story short, 
if they lesion the part from the brain that we think is uh, functionally the same as the hippocampus, uh, these fish cannot learn spatial tasks. So if they have to remember I have to swim like this and not like that, they cannot do that anymore. While the in intact fish can learn to swim via a certain route, and, uh, and when you lesion that part of the brain, the hippocampus-related structures, they cannot uh, take the right uh, escape routes in, in a complex learning paradigm. Um, more about quali uh, say, uh, high qualities of fish, cod and uh, salmonid and halibut, uh, they can very well perform in trace conditioning studies, which means that you offer a stimulus, a light flash, and you wait for a while and you can give food near the light flash. Or you can give the food separated, separately from the light flash. So you can wait in time and you can wait in time and in place. And that's what you call trace conditioning. Now, uh, these fish and many fish, as far as we, we see also the zebra fish and carp and so on, have the same qualities. Th they can learn that in a few trials. And they will remember that for a long, long time. And not three seconds, like people say for goldfish. Memory of three seconds is bullshit. No, 88 days for these fish, they remember the flesh. If they give after, say, several uh, trials training, they know flesh. Food over there. If you wait and, uh, for 88 days and you give the flesh again, they will again go to the place where they expect the food. So they have a good, uh, good memory. And it also means that because of the, the space and the time, that fish know what's going on around them in time and in space. So they have an awareness of their environment. I always give another example. A stickleback, when a stickleback makes a nest, it has a territory around that uh, nest and if there is an intruder, the stickleback, the male, will challenge the intruder and, s and fight and follow it for a long, long distance. If the nest is here, the stickleback will go to that corner, which is a huge distance for that fish. fish. Now, what if that stickleback does not have a memory in space and in time? It will never find its nest back, and reproductive success will go down the hill, of course. So. Just if you look as a biologist at the, at, at the fish, you, you can tell already, yes, they have range, yes, they have memory, yes, they can learn, and so on, and so on. Here, let's an uh, experiment. Here is the light and the net, which fish do not like for whatsoever reason. And here they can escape. And this is from you at all in Guelph. Um, and in trout, it was done in trout. You see the first trial, successful avoidance, so that means escape through that hole. And uh, after five trials, 70% of the fish escape in, in a short uh, time. So if only five trials, and they know already if the flesh is coming, there will be a net, so let's get away. Yeah? Fear avoidance, because they don't like the net, and that's fear. Another thing from our own uh, department, uh, studies by Peter Klaren. Um, feeding behavior in carp. What we did here, we trained the fish, or actually they learn very quickly, within half an hour they know. If we uh, put a, a little ball on a stick in the aquarium, they've never seen that before. Within half an hour, 15 minutes to half an hour, they know if they touch the, the ball that they will get some food. We do not know which of the fish is doing that that we are trying to find out now with uh, tagging. But this is, say, group behavior. And my impression is, if I look at it, that some fish are the guys that, that will hit the ball and the others will eat. But for sure, the important thing right now is, that is not a question of, right now, the interesting thing is, here is when the lights go on and go off again. And what you see is that before uh, light, and after light, that's where the most, f most of the food is taken by the fish. That's when they want to eat. Now, th the consequence of this is, should become clear immediately. What do we do? We are awake here between 6 and uh, 18, 1800 hours, for instance. 
nine, the technician comes in to feed the fish, and when he leaves at five, he feeds them again. So he feeds them two times at a moment that fish normally do not eat. Is that okay? No, that's not okay. Because uh, if we do pair fed controls, which means that we allow the fish to touch the ball and the food they provide themselves, is, is known and is also given to pair fed controls. If you do that, you can see that uh, the specific growth rate is very significantly uh, increased, uh, more than four times they grow tremendously faster when you allow them to feed when they want. Now if you go back into uh, literature, my Chinese is very poor, but the Chinese 3,000, 5,000 years ago already knew that this is the case because the, the, the emperors were fed carp that were caught at night just after the fish had fed. My boss knew that, I didn't know, we did the experiment and it makes sense because we did all these calculations and we know, we know now that the intestinal physiology, so the, 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 the eating and the, what the intestine is doing with the, with the food is really set for a night animal in a carp. And if you feed it during the day, it's not efficient. So, and for, say, for aquaculture, when, when the farmers have a margin in how much food they put in and how much money they get back from the fish, this is a very significant effect. Do fish sleep? Another question. All, all things related to, to well, welfare and feeling happy. You do not feel happy when you are kept away from sleeping. I know, everybody wants to sleep. What happens in aquaculture, people put on the lights continuously or off, because they, they know empirically the fish do better if the lights are on or off continuously. Well, this is a carp instrumented with uh, EEG electrodes, and here's the floating uh, data logger, and this is the wake uh, EEG, and uh, this is a sleep EEG with K complexes and spindles, and those phenomena also occur in your brain when you start to fall asleep before you go into REM sleep. So the rapid eye movement sleep is something that is not present in fish, but the four phases before you doze away, that is present in fish. So, so they do sleep, and they sleep like dogs. Small periods of time over the day, they will sleep. So my, um, my uh, message is fish do really sleep. They have they need time to readjust brain activity, so allow them to do that. Because this is, in this allostasis concept, this is the intensity, the duration, the controllability, the predictability, all these things that, that are, are mounted on one another. And this is one of the, the, the stress factors that is adding to bad water, uh, disturbance, not sleeping, and so on. So you know for yourself the consequences of that, also for fish. So uh, the way, uh, the, the take this uh, picture for yourself later on if you're interested. The way to look at welfare and allostasis, uh, get a better uh, look on stress because there's eustress uh, uh, and there's distress and there's a whole area where you can, uh, can be happy and where you need stimuli and so on and so on. Later this year there will be a PhD uh, defense in Nijmegen where we play with this model and where we show that with and I will show you in one example in a minute, where we show that, for instance, with uh, age or with uh, an enriched environment, you can make a shift in this, in this shaded uh, area of nice and, and good behavior and, and poor situations. It is this, this sort of spectrum of, of conditions where predictability and controllability are and, and safety versus unpredictable, uncontrollable, and life-threatening conditions. And it, it's how is this divided that determines if your fish is happy. And you can put for yourself, if you try to remember this picture, this cartoon, you can put your situation of your fish somewhere here, and you know what to do or not to do. Uh, so that's what I'm, I was just saying. So determine allostatic state, how, how is the condition of the fish, and appreciate the resilience. What is the resilience of the fish? How much can the fish have? The individual, the species, and so on and so on. And only when stress load overrules resilience, so if the fish can no longer cope 
with the challenge you give, then pathologies will occur. So try to keep that in mind. Now, the consideration of welfare and aquaculture. What do we want? We want cheap food, which means production pressure. We want good quality, quality control and guarantee, because health uh, uh, conditions. And we want variation because the consumers get bored. If you eat salmon every day, five, seven days a week, month after month, you don't like salmon anymore. So we want variation. And all these, uh, these wishes, these uh, aquaculture wishes, uh, have consequences. You get distress due to high density, health of fish and consumer are involved, and basal knowledge of the fish species is lacking. If you want another fish, a meager, what do we know about meager? It grows fast. But for the rest, we do know very little about mega. Things like that. I wish we could eat zebrafish because we know a lot about zebrafish. Uh, the, the water problem, uh, recirculating aquaculture systems are the new production mode. Uh, Land-based, you are in the Netherlands, you can only culture fish if you have a complete control over water. There's no, no allowance for nitrogen waste uh, into the environment in the Netherlands. You have to control everything yourself. My message is be careful with our freshwater resources. What is aquaculture? Aquaculture is nitrogen input, protein production, and nitrogen output. That's what it's all about. This is what we are interested in. And how do we get our nitrogen into the system? Well, from plants or animals. And of course, if you have a primary production from plants, that's cheaper. Uh, also economically cheaper, but also environmentally cheaper. Uh, fish protein is expensive. And uh, the times have gone now that we needed five kilograms of fish to produce one kilogram of salmon. But that's only a few years ago. Uh, there's another problem with fish. Fish need protein for basal metabolism. That's different. We can do with sugar and, uh, and other things. Fish do need always protein for basal metabolism. And that makes an extra challenge on the input side, of course. The output side is a problem because you get ammonia, nitrite, nitrate uh, and the amount of water that you need to get rid of the, of the waste. So th those are the considerations here. And what we should do is produce algae as source of protein and essential fats, understand the biology better, allostasis and stress physiology, as I've explained to you. And I think we should put the microbiology here to make a shortcut in uh, waste uh, uh, disposal. And there is new uh, bacteria produced in Nijmegen, among others, uh, where we have a shortcut for ammonium straight to uh, nitrogen gas, which is environmentally friendly. Those bacteria are rare and are difficult to grow, but we have them in Nijmegen. And there are in the, in the Netherlands already big uh, reactors to control uh, wastewater uh, production. So fish welfare and protein production, poor and good, unnatural conditions, distress. If you know the biology, one of my major messages to you, and if you can keep stick to natural conditions and uh, provide some eustress or give some stimuli, then you are shifting the balance to the right and you get a, a good welfare and a good protein production. And this is a matter of proper husbandry and understanding the physiology. Um, resilience, the flexibility to cope with is what life is about. Try to remember for yourself, after a holiday you respond differently to a stressful situation than just before you go on holidays. You can become really nasty with <laughs> I'm going on holidays, and when you're back, it's like, okay, let's handle, yeah? But this holds also for fish. What we do with several fish, we can give uh, task variables like a shock to, uh, and, and we, we use one example, inhibitory fear avoidance. So that is a complex behavior that we test in several fish, uh, for instance, with age, with strains, with enrichment and with chronic stress before you do these tests. So you do a, a complex paradigm, a complex study of 
uh, rather complex behavior. And then we have the readout. Here is a, a tracing uh, readout for behavior. Where are the fish when you give them these challenges or these, these variables? Um, we can measure cortisol, of course, in the fish. And we can also do gene expression in the brain. And I'll show you two examples of that. Enrichment of fish. So we have eggs from, uh, from fish that we mix and we divide them in two batches. One is kept barren, so just glass in your children's uh, aquarium. And we look then in, in the uh, anxiety-like <laughs> behavior. Um, so the fish is, is transported to the white environment and there's a dark environment. And what we do then, uh, we keep them there for a while, then we lift the slide and they naturally prefer to go to the dark. And when they do so, they get a shock. And we found out which shock they should get without doing too much harm. And uh, we give them one, two, three trials of, of this test. And we, we look how long does it take or do they, do they eventually avoid going to the dark because they know they're going to get a shock. Their, their preference, their urge is to go to the dark, but they get a shock if they go there. Here you see anxiety-like behavior, so a very complex behavior, uh, and the consequence of being grown up barren or enriched. And you see already, this is behavior, the standard deviations are big, but it's very significant. We always see, this is the average for what we've done, the latency to go into the dark, and there is a, a big difference. Enriched fish uh, know the, the latency, it takes longer before they go to the dark because they know they're going to get a shock and they know far better than the fish that were uh, grown up in a barren environment. They don't know what to do. Yeah? H. We test fish at six months and at 24 months for a zebra fish and 12 months is sort of the standard age that people use so we compare those. And let's see, um, so here's again the latency to enter. And th the, this is the 12-month-old uh, fish, and we compare now the 6 and the 24-month. And you see that young fish and 12-month-old fish do not differ in latency, so they learn equally well. But if you go to the 24-month-old, so th these are, uh, how do you call that, senior fish, really old fish like me. And you're still mid. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, especially the first try received very significant effect in the behavior. Very significant. Uh, 6 and 12 uh, and 24 months. Not on average the behavior is sort of difficult to see. But there is an effect visible. If you look at the genes in the, in the brain, you get more uh, a clear answer. BDNF and PCNA, those are genes involved in the plasticity of the brain. How quickly can the brain adjust and re make new uh, connections and so on and so on. That is determined by these genes. And you see in the old fish, these genes are down and they never come back with their aging, Alzheimer. Um, uh, the receptors for cortisol, GR-alpha and uh, mineral cortisol receptor, you see that the older fish, in particular the older fish, uh, uh, the one of the two uh, GRs, so the glucocorticoid receptor beta subtype, is uh, downregulated at high uh, age, at uh, yeah at high age, and uh, the MR is upregulated. So they get a different profile of receptors for cortisol in the brain, and that relates to learning and things like that. Uh, so it, it does make sense. And then here we have. Um, uh, uh, ratios of these things and there are the most important things are going on at high uh, at high age so 24 months is an old zebra fish and they cannot learn anymore because the equipment is no longer there so here's the results uh, summarized together and what we think is that with in this allostatic curve with 24 months we are close to this crossing of eustress to distress where, where the animals can no longer take the challenges that you give in this avoidance uh, test. So, balancing welfare and production in fish agriculture, 
appreciation of fish welfare means that you should consider fish as vertebrates like you, your cat and your dog and all the consequences that go with that. And sustainable fish, yes, this is a phenomenal challenge if you keep this in mind. This is it. And now I'm open for questions. Yeah, time. thank you, Her, for this very interesting conference. A lot of history in this time. And now time for some questions. I, I think that we have different question because in addition to this basic science, always we can think about how it's possible to apply this knowledge to the aquaculture activity. So time for question, if the people have any works. So, uh, first of all, here the thanks for your presentation. Yeah. It's always really rich in knowledge and, yeah. and details about uh, how the fish uh, are and yes, how complicated are they. But I have uh, two questions. Um, first of all, um, you talked uh, uh, at the beginning of the second part about the proactive and reactive animals and how could be a proactive animal more adrenaline animal than reactive, that uh, they are so more mm, cortisol, cortisol yeah. animals. So, um, and also you talk about the adaptive role of cortisol and the, that the adrenaline is the mainly stress uh, mm -hmm. hormone. So, which animals do you think are more, um, have more abilities for adaptations, proactive or reactive <coughs> animals? Um, in principle, if, if you take the, uh, the extremes, so really proactive fish and really reactive fish, then the reactive fish will do better in aquaculture. That is a common, uh, common practice we, we know from salmon and, uh, and many other species. If you take the, the reactive fish, the, pro the proactive fish, the, the, the fighters say, the risk seekers, they are vulnerable and they will fight with one another. And I think the power of, of this knowledge lies in the fact that your you should not, in that case, you should not only consider the individual, but the population, the group. It is the group that is strong, and it's the species that is, say, protected from uh, getting lost due to all kinds of uh, conditions. So uh, it is a very difficult question to answer uh, in, in great detail, but I, I think we know now that these things are going on, and we know, uh, we can recognize that some responses in proactive and reactive fish are quite different um, and, and we also do see them in, in nature but you cannot always tell uh, from the outside and so if you have that opportunity then it is a little bit easier but overall because this phenomenon is always there in all populations of animals of vertebrates you will see this continuum from uh, proactive to reactive and it, it is the, the power of the, of the group. The, uh, I do not know all the roles that fish individuals within a group play, but they, they have their own roles and it's the group. It's like a, a school or a shoal of fish, which is also not very clear why some fish are on the outside and some are on the inside of a shoal and things like that. Th there's more study needed to, uh, to study this, the importance. We are certainly uh, doing that kind of exp experiment, exactly what you are are saying um, because we, we can now tag the fish, even the, the zebra fish with uh, three millimeter tags that we can recognize individual fish and we can take, can take fish out of the groups and see how the behaviors uh, change and the consequences of, of how they change their behavior. So yeah, that's all I can say at the moment. It, it is a, it's an extremely good question and I, I think this is one one point in research where we need more and uh, far more information, in particular in fish, because all the, the different behaviors that you see in fish and all the different niches that are taken may require adaptations in that part of the behavior. So evolution is more related with uh, populations than individuals? With species, 
uh, yeah, it's the species. Uh, Darwin tells you that it's the species uh, that's what it's all about. It's not the individual, certainly not. It's like altruism and things like that. That's interesting for uh, for, an, int for uh, an individual at, f at first sight, but it is the, the species that uh, has a profit of it. And the second one, yeah. Um, Mm, there are a lot of uh, different kind of stressors, and uh, but uh, for you, which one, in your opinion, is the is the best of uh, as biomarker of uh, stress? Uh, which one should we take as um, a reference point? Uh, it depends on the, the facilities that you have. Um, uh, I would say that. Uh, if you are studying, if you are interested in acute stress, so what happens uh, if I fool around with the fish for sorting, for instance, then and transportation, you can do with uh, a plasma sample of, or, and cortisol. And if you are if you are lucky and you can sample in time, you could try to look at adrenaline. But uh, I give a warning that is difficult. But Hormi is going to tell us in the near future, or not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the, the big problem with cortisol uh, is that fish will show habituation. If, if you are in the eustress setting, so the fish can handle and can launch uh, a cortisol response that effectively brings back the stress condition, then uh, if that happens again and once again and once again, then this, the cortisol response will go down and you won't see anything anymore. Classical habituation. Uh, my message to you all is that a cortisol response, if you can show it in under fixed conditions, is nice, but it is no more than a snapshot. And if you want a view, say in, uh, a chronic stress indication, you need something else. And that has been published uh, last week, I think, in PLOS One, uh, where we determine uh, cortisol profiles in scales. So we take a scale from the skin of the fish, and in the matrix of the scale, uh, cortisol and its precursors and metabolites are, are deposited. And uh, we've done experiments with uh, ze zebrafish, carp, and tilapia where we can show that if you give them chronic stress, you get a, a recognizable profile of, of these steroids in the scales. And that is not a reflection, of, not a snapshot anymore, but that is an historical reflection. So that's where we should go in the future. That's why we are going to talk next week in uh, Ghent University. See if we can get some money for that. Sorry. Uh, this means that you are using the scale similar to the otoliths, no? N it, it's yes similar no. concept. Well, the, the concept is, is the same. Autolits uh, have been taken for, for aging, uh, telling the age of the fish. The scale is also growing. If the fish grows, the scale will grow. Um, an autolit is difficult to collect. I mean, if you, if you go to a farmer and you say to the farmer, well, can I uh, collect your autolit when the fish is dead? And with a scale, you just can take one scale and we can tell exactly what has been going on the, the, the month before. So that is, is really a very convenient. And there's another beauty of the, of the scale, if you allow me. The beauty of the scale is the, the idea of determining stress hormone levels in scale comes from the clinic, where in the in pediatricians in, the, in Nijmegen, in the hospital, they take hair from the children and they determine cortisol in their hair. But your hair is exposed to the sun, maybe not in the Netherlands, but here for sure, so here you have a problem. Uh, you wash your hair with uh, what kind of soap do we know, and so on and so on. The hair is, is uh, tearing down, so they have to, to make subdivisions of the hair, and then they can tell something about um, stress. You can take saliva samples. The beauty of the scale is it's in the skin, so the skin is covering the, the scale, and it is a, a continuously exposed compartment. And the matrix, that's the only thing we do not know yet in detail, where exactly the cortisol is binding in the scale. 
but the scale is a is a plate of collagen, and the top layer is mineralized. And where exactly uh, the cortisol is, we do not know, but we can absolutely uh, for sure determine the, that when you give more stress to the fish, you will see more cortisol over time. And it's not a s snapshot anymore, but a, a chronic stress marker. And I think that is very handy for aquaculture. If you know more than just this one peak, which you have to define very carefully if you want to measure it properly. Most people select one hour as a, as a time point for stress definition based on cortisol in plasma. But that's only one hour. And if, if habituation occurs, you may not see anything. You may conclude there is no stress while there is significant stress visible in the scales. Yeah. In first, I want to say that this is a very interesting story all about this. And second, I have two short questions. About the populations, do you think that individuals could be determinants in the population's evol evolution? Is the first question. Yeah, I think it's the distribution of, of the composition of how, of, of how populations are made up that determine the success. I, is it only one male or, you know, it's that continuum of proactive and reactive fish and, and how is the continuum built up and is, is there, are there intermediates and so on and so on. So that is what we need to know in the, in the future. What, what the quality of a population is if you know the distribution of, of, the, of the individual fish. So all, all I can say at the moment, I, I have no... Well, what, what we do know, if you take a, a proactive fish, the one that gives the, the, the high adrenaline surge in the beginning, if, if you challenge those fish too much, they, they, are really, they become vulnerable very quickly. Adrenaline surges are no good. Adrenaline is a hormone you have to be really careful with. Cortisol also, with adrenaline even more. Because adrenaline will give epithelial uh, effects, lifting, uh, loosening of uh, connective tissue and, and so on and so on. So that, that, that is really, it, it is a, a trade-off between giving an adrenaline response and releasing sugar for the fight-flight uh, reactions. And um, the consequences of it where it comes to uh, becoming leaky, for instance. Uh, if, if a fish, if you inject adrenaline in a fish, you will, the gills will become leaky very quickly and you get osmotic disturbances. So, this but this some, some individuals uh, can be controlled that situation with adrenaline in this case? I, I think so, but th th this is a very difficult question for me to answer because I, I have not done experiments so far to, to check for that, but that is a very good question. Uh, and I, I, I do, do not know the answer at the moment. Okay. Work to uh, do for you. <laughs> <laughs> and the second question, respect fish behavior. Uh, what do you think about fish learning? Uh, do you believe that fish learning is for imitation, like high vertebrates, or is a genetic quality? Uh, for example, the migrations. I think uh, one thing that I have not said so far is that we tend to look at behavior and at, uh, at animal behavior from a human point of view. And, and psychology is very, uh, human psychology is, is everywhere. And my, my suggestion would be that you try to look at the fish unbiased. Just look, what, look at the behavior, that you, what does it mean? like uh, what I was telling about the stickleback chasing uh, an intruder, things like that. Um, be, be careful in what you say. Be careful in, in, in transposing consequences from inhibitory fear avoidance, for instance, which, which is a paradigm that is, has been taken from rats and mouse, mice studies. Uh, I didn't show not to, to make it too complex, but we, we have done that same uh, study with uh, what we think of uh, more proactive or more reactive fish because we have different strains 
and the outcomes of that, there is uh, very significant effects in inhibitory fear for this learning between those strains, but the outcomes proper we actually do not understand. It was counterintuitive. When we thought this is a, a fish uh, that should learn more quickly, it didn't, and the other way around. And that, that did correlate with, with all kinds. Of we, we simply do not know yet. Again, a very good question, and a very difficult question to answer. And we, we really need more because if, if we, we predict too much based on how we think we should uh, respond in, in such a paradigm, and that is wrong. Just look at it and analyze without any bias, and then sooner or later it will become clear what the value of it is. For us, the most important thing at the moment uh, is that we can show that fish do learn, because that is, that is a, a statement Many people do not like, if, if I say in, in the Netherlands uh, to the Ministry of Fisheries, fish uh, can learn very well, there's the whole fisheries uh, setting in the Netherlands who says, who's, who's this guy from Nijmegen, what kind of asshole is that? That's what they see. For me it's important to show learning, fish can learn, fish have structures, I mean, we can show that if we, expo if we give trials to the fish to learn, that there are changes in genes in the, in the telencephalon, for instance. There are people who say fish have no brains. Well, I, I, I will explain them and will show them that they do have brains. And then the next step is that the sports fishermen in the Netherlands say, well, the telencephalon, there is no cerebrum like in, in human beings. No, there is not a cerebrum like in human beings. There is a telencephalon and try to appreciate that structure, what, I, what is going on in the telencephalon of fish, and you can give challenges and see if there is something going on, and that we can show very clearly. And we, we can show that, that the behavior, I've shown you that the behavior is changing when you give a painful stimulus. That is one of the, the most powerful statements I can make right now, that a painful stimulus, and painful is already a term from human physiology, Pain. Pain means uh, interpretation of, a, of a noxious stimulus. So, but let's say for, for convenience, a painful stimulus which changes a learned behavior means that there is learning going on and that the learning process is modulated by this stimulus. That's similar as in your case. So that's, that's how I try to convince people. There's many people in the Netherlands who do not want to listen to that. They simply say, well, this is nonsense. But I'm a biologist, so I have the complete freedom to say so. In addition, uh, in, in, in the, from the example of the birds and the immigrations, I can't Im imagine that, that the individuals born with the knowledge of what they must to do to survive. So I think mm, the first response to adapt to the environment mm -hmm. is imitation of your adults. Yeah, uh, th that is certainly a component uh, in behavior that, that occurs, but you can uh, uh, grow up fish individually and they still can uh, do these learning uh, behaviors without any, uh, with any uh, example, say, given by the parents. But there is, for sure, parental imprinting, or whatever you call it, uh, going on also in fish. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have the same questions to Andre about the learning to fish, yeah. because I think that the fish in part is learning and in part is instinct, is in, yes, but, okay, yeah. Um, I have curiosity about the opercular opening, when in the first, uh, in, in the first moment, you say that in the pain, in, in fish, uh, they have more Opercular opening, yes? Yeah, the beat rate goes up, yeah. Yeah, but in stress, uh, 
how how I um, can difference stress of pain. In yeah. in case uh, about, um, when I when you say opercular opening in this case. Uh, that is the exact the reason uh, that I show these uh, these behavioral studies and the histology studies with the with the uh, mucus cells, because there you see a differential response to the handling, the stress, and and the what we call pain painful stimulus, the, the clipping. There is a differential response, which in, in particular becomes clear in the histology analysis. Huh? But no for observation. Oh, yeah, also in observation, and, and what I showed is what they call scototaxis in tilapia is, was the first experiment, that's why I'm showing it. We have better this fear, inhibitory fear for this. I mean, you can do that experiment also without the shock, and then just look at transition and things like that, between white and black. Um, and we can follow individual fish uh, nowadays, so it, those results are repeated with several fish, with carp, tilapia, and so on. Um, it is visible, but you, this is another message to all, all students of biology. Sit in front of an aquarium and look. Try to recognize a fish and, and start looking for a long time what's going on, what they do. Because we seldom take the time and the rest to just observe and watch, 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 watch what's going on. And then you will see many things and patterns in behavior. And for sure, uh, if, you, if you put too many fish together in an aquarium and you clip one, then it's really difficult to find out what's going on. Okay. Um, other question about the umbral of pain. Is, I mean, every species have the same umbral, uh, seawater or fresh water, because in the vertebrates, no? The cow of, of um, horses uh, have the different umbral pain. No. So I want to know if in the fish is the same or is different. This is, this is again a question that needs uh, research to be done. All I can say is there's 35,000 species of fish. They're all different. And... Uh, the things that I've shown about free-ending uh, neurites in the skin, that has not been published yet. Uh, that's new for fish. But I think it is a vertebrate pattern. It, it is present in all vertebrates, in my opinion. Yes, I know that a horse is far more sensitive to an electrical uh, threat than a cow or a sheep or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that, that will depend on, on hair and, and, and the thickness of the skin. The, for instance, the, um, the catfish that I've shown has an extremely thick skin. And th this I think it's because th it's an adaptation for the fish to go out of the water and uh, to run in, uh, on dirt roads and whatever. Uh, and th the skin is adapted to that. It's really, really strong. Okay. And uh, about uh, the f free neurites in that skin, I do not know. I had a... Turkish girl in the laboratory, but she screwed up the antibodies, so <laughs> she had a look at the skin, but we, I have no answer on, on this uh, skin of the... I do know that the uh, catfish skin is loaded with uh, uh, club cells, they are called, and they, they are full of uh, alarm pheromones, but uh, that's another story. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, more questions? Well, I have some questions. Really, I am very happy. I am very happy because we we got some questions for you. Yeah. Difficult question is this yeah, is a good really signal. Difficult. Yeah, good. Um, I told you previously that there are several several stories in you in you told, and then I I would like to know your opinion about the because stress stress the first point is the perception of the stress. Mm -hmm. Okay, I am thinking just now about the aquaculture. This is a uh, old conversation with uh, with some fish far. Uh, what do you think about this new uh, uh, way just to decrease the perception of the stress? And then I using 
different kind of uh, substance, natural substance, or pharmaceutical substance, just to avoid, for example, the stress, uh, the chronic stress by density. What do you think about this, this possibility? Yeah, that is, that is another very interesting uh, item that I did not touch because <laughs> yeah, otherwise it's too much for two hours. Um, one thing that, uh, that, that we published already, very recently, uh, I don't know by heart, but it has been published, that is if you give a reward to the fish. So we train zebra fish in this case with, uh, uh, with a conditioned stimulus uh, and we provide uh, nice food for instance. And we know that if you activate uh, in, in higher vertebrates, if you activate reward systems, and there was one slide on the interconnectivity of those systems, if you activate reward systems, you suppress stress regulatory mechanisms. And we, we have uh, clear evidence now that this works in, in zebra fish. You, you can uh, train them and uh, give a positive uh, reward, like nice food or whatever, uh, mate, a mating condition, something like that. And then uh, if you continue to give the, the, uh, the stimulus, then you, every time you give the stimulus, you, you will uh, activate the reward system and suppress the, the stress system. And we, we have applied that in, uh, in actual experiments and show that the fish do far better if you train them first. And it's really si simple to do. You can give a positive reward linked to the light flash, for instance, 10 to 15 uh, sessions training. And then if you come again with a light flash, the stress system is suppressed. And you can do a better handling, uh, say, sorting and transportation uh, is that what you asked? <laughs> uh, yeah, but because uh, just thinking about the possibility to apply this to the aquaculture activity. Yeah, yeah. Th this was our message. Uh, the, the programs that we ran on the, on the catfish uh, was particularly, uh, we were asked to address whether we could condition the fish and uh, suppress uh, stress activity. And uh, the eventually, we succeeded. The, the problem here was that uh, I don't know whether you have experienced with a catfish, but we, we buy the catfish this size, and in a month they are about this size, and if you go on, they, they really they outgrow our containers. We cannot keep them very well. And then it, the other problem was that the farmers that provide us with the catfish, we had three partners in the, in the consortium to do these studies, and all three went broke. So we had no supply of fish. And then uh, I had two PhDs uh, working on that project, Remy and uh, Jeroen, and uh, I put them on zebra fish work. So we, I had to defend at the Dutch Research Council that we were not doing this with uh, catfish, but with zebra fish, which they didn't like uh, at first. But with zebra fish, you can show this immediately. That's a general concept in, uh, in vertebrate physiology. Okay, uh, more question? No? Well, Her, thank you very much. Uh, we know that tomorrow, today and tomorrow in the afternoon you will have another talk about uh, more stress. And thanks again for this very interesting talk. Uh, we hope to continue with our collaboration in the future. Of course. Of course. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome.